So, um, my name's well, let's go with the introduction. So, first of all, my name's Brian Wilson. Um, I run a company that none of you have ever heard of. Uh, I've also, I help a volunteer at London uh, B-Sides. Did um, Scotland and Bristol this year as well. Um, help with a rookie track with uh, Mr. David up there. Um, sponsored B-Sides Liverpool this year, which was a good, good venue. Good gig. I'm also the manager of the beer farmers who happen to be on track one right now. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that that's happened. Um, normally I ask the audience who we are. Yeah, do we have any network guys in here? Who's, who's dedicated? Do you predominantly do networking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you probably don't know all this already. Um, what do you guys do? You guys, server guys? Developer. Developer? Okay, you might learn something. Okay, well, we've got that. Right, Hollywood has ruined IT security. We've known it for years, especially network security. You watch anything, for example, like, have you ever seen the film Firewall? Harrison Ford gets a thing from the fax machine, scans the screen because basically the printer's gone. Not going to happen. You know, it's like the, we're in, we're on the FBI firewall. Oh, they've got a new one. It's going to take me a minute. And they're straight through that. It's like, it's unrealistic. And people get this unrealistic view of networking, especially uh, network security, and it just doesn't happen. And the problem is basically the design. Companies like Cisco and Juniper have got massive websites, which basically they um, promote to design things um, by industry, by technology types, basically, because you've got 400 people, 400 computers, just because you work in an industry uh, like medicine, you've got regulation there, insurance got their own ones. There's no two networks are the same. Safe blueprint. Um, sorry? Safe blueprint. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, or Juniper? Fantastic, right, okay. But basically, what happens during design, if you've basically got designers who aren't really doing the job very well, you'll hear a lot of support guys going, we've got a workaround for that. And that's pretty much because the design team spent, oh, that'll, that'll get in, that'll do. And workarounds aren't really what you'll be doing, especially from a security point of view going forward. Um, the Everything going to talk here should work on most switches, even your home network, your home, home routers should be able to do most of the stuff on there. Um, not all home routers work. Not all, not all vendors code is the same, basically. It's, um, okay, I've lost my train for now. Thanks to it. Right, so let's go with traffic. Nothing on your network should be unpredictable. If you leave your house in the morning and go to work, you know roughly how long it's going to take you from leaving the house to your office. You know what route you're going to take, and you know you've got deviations. It's predictable. Nothing on your home, on your computer network should be unpredictable. If you've got unpredictable traffic, you've got problems. So if you know traffic takes two milliseconds to get from there to then, it's suddenly five milliseconds, it's only three milliseconds, but there's something different from the norm. It needs investigating. Um, the other sign model, everyone familiar with that? Anyone not familiar with that? Well, from a network point of view, we see it kind of differently. We kind of see it like that. We delivered it to the system. What happens, it happens. The problem with that is developers and uh, people working apps and databases they see it slightly different. They see it like this. Everything's network fault. If it doesn't work, it must be the network because, right. yeah, it's, exactly, thanks. Um, anyway, this basically means that network guys tend to do a lot of troubleshooting. Normally it ends up with them saying, have you tried turning it off and on again? They do that, it works, and you feel like this. <laughs> Get that a lot. Um, but again, going back to Hollywood, this is how Hollywood betrays Security, IT security, it's all about lots of stuff, not quite understand what screens, but it's there. But in essence, we all know from a security professional, if you're a pen tester, you're more than likely not be looking at stuff like that, you're more than likely to be seeing that on a more regular basis, because that is where you're going to find all your problems. You're going to look for other issues, that's it. You don't look for the matrix. <coughs> but if we go through the layers one, two, three, four, because that's what we have to do, um, with layer one, obviously, we've got the physical stuff. So it's your, your routers, your switches, the firewalls, network cards, uh, your cabling, uh, 802.3 is all your cabling, fiber optics, 802.11 is all your wireless stuff, your RF, Bluetooth, they're all covered under those standards. Um, the reason why you attack this layer is basically gate access. You're going to need access onto the network, so you will do that at one point. Persistence, or just to disrupt it, just to basically... Um, remove it from the you know, capability you can't have it nor can they um, and those problems at layer one tend to be misconfigurations um, they tend to be someone unpatched something turns something off it's going to be something like that um, and there's no defense because 
defence, you know, get spares. Budgets really don't help. Try and get a budget for spares. Yeah, I don't know about you lot, but I, I can't, wherever I work, no chance to get spares. So I, I put away again this. If you monetize it, so I'm 24 ports Cisco switches. These are five or four different models, which are the rough cost a couple of weeks ago. Now, if you, well, if you lose one of those, you, you potentially lose 24 people. If you're paying them £10 an hour, it adds up pretty damn quick. If it takes you two days to get that switch back replaced because no one's working, effectively those switches now cost you that. And it's not, yeah, that, that's, a, that's the argument you need to give for your business. Say, look, if you want me to, uh, if you want me to have spares, can I have some spares, please? And this is the reason why. Monetize it. As soon as you do that, then you can turn around and say, there's my argument. Having a four, four thousand pound switch sitting there doing nothing. Well, it's going to be that much. Um, wireless networks. With wireless networks, you've got, obviously got footprints. And uh, you want to make sure your footprint doesn't go anywhere you don't want it to go. For example, outside the building. Um, Meraki do a really good job of this. So these access points here, you can see where they, people congregate the bright nights. They're probably more like water coolers and stuff like that. But you don't want your access points next to the side of your wall because then you're just issuing wireless into your car park. Unless you operate in some kind of car park, you need wireless in. That's not good. So wireless networks are a bugbear because no one controls them. There's many ways to control them. You go, you can buy paint. So there's many things to suppress it. But ultimately, if you're not looking after your wireless, most companies have wireless network now. Please, please do something with them, seriously. But if we um, also look at job adverts, this is a job advert for a place in Cheltenham. Um, now, the second line down there should give you a clue to where a place in Cheltenham is. But I, my argument is this. If you're going to employ a Cisco CCIE or a CCMP, is anyone CCMP here? Okay, I'm CCS, CCMP security and CCM routing. Um, <laughs> I would like to think that you are familiar with protocols such as TCP, OSPF, BGP, at that point, CCMP, and CCIE more so. This now tells us what they're using. Probably the technology is using, they're also using Nexus, um, no one's using ACL, this is Spanish tree. That only needed to be that. But someone in the HR department went, look, we need to be precise with this. No, just go off and get a CCMP, make sure they've got CCMP, check the certification, and then ask them questions. Don't, don't advertise what equipment you're using. It's ridiculous. And you see many adverts that. It's a great way of finding out what companies you've got. Um, come on, this is physical layer security. Do we need to go through this? You know, lock laptops, that kind of stuff. Um, some of them wireless networks for guests. Don't let them on your production network. One good tip I've got, um, worked quite well actually, um, I had a customer, they had, they think they had problems with their wireless network. I got them to disable it because obviously between 7 and 6 in the evening, 7 in the morning, 7 and 6 in the evening, they use it for work. After that, no one's in the office. No one should be connecting to it. So we bought a cheap little router and we turned their wireless off at 6 o'clock. We then put that thing up, same SSID, same password. Just to see if everyone would log on to it, because they were all logging on to it. Well, they shouldn't do, and they were. So we found them. And, um, well, we took measures, but, you know, you really need to do that. But disabling USB ports, all that kind of stuff, that's all pretty common, basic stuff. But what's more important is if that you don't follow this stuff, and you piss the network team off, you end up, basically, with a 10 meg half duplex connection. So, <laughs> you know, it ultimately... The network team run the network. There's nothing on your environment which we don't control. I don't care how much a server costs. It's connected to my network. I'll control that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Layer 2. It's where we get really interesting stuff. <sighs> Layer 2 stuff is just not secure. It never has been, never will be. Um, every Layer 2 protocol, spanning tree, um, CDP, ARP, never been bought with any security in my function. And so basically it's very easy to attack. Um, let's go through this. I mean, cam table, if I throw enough MAC addresses you switch, it's a hub. Um, DHP protection, if I throw enough MAC addresses you DHP server, you've got no users. Uh, network segmentation, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, span tree, like I say, link local discovery protocols at CDP. If I can get that information from your network, I now know what switch type you're using, which image it's running, some IP address information, 
I could probably, you know, start building up a whole thing. And there's no reason why a computer needs to know that. So to save up no user ports. Um, and this is a conversation <laughs> I have quite a lot. Someone actually said to me, we don't need VLANs. We have antivirus. You try and explain to them why you need separate VLANs. And <laughs> the problem is, um, without segmenting your network, you've got a flat network. It's like this room. Everyone can talk to everyone in this room. There's no restrictions. If you place a VLAN, we've now got a door where it needs to talk after that VLAN. We can put some controls in. And, uh, you know, I think this categorizes most systems nowadays will have majority of that stuff. They may have more different server types. They may have different types of application servers. But there's no reason why they shouldn't all be in different VLANs. Simple fact, basically, one, it makes it unscalable. But two, you can now start securing it. Um, if you run out of IP addresses on the user VLANs, that's fine. Add another VLAN. That's an argument I see quite a lot. Um, Spiceworks, from the forum. Um, run out of IP addresses, what do I do? I'll make it a slash 20. Fine, you'll never run out of IP addresses. That implies they've got a flat network. But it also means that all their stuff's in the same VLAN. Add another VLAN. That's what you need to do. Now you're changing nothing that's existing that's working. You're amending something and adding to it. So zero risk. But if you change the DSP scope, 100% of your stuff's going to change. That's ridiculous. It loves your friends. Um, and they also stop bad things happening in your network. Predators. People going from host to host and taking stuff. That took me ages. <laughs> okay. Um, if you look at, for example, a database server. Thank you. A database server doesn't need to talk to the internet. Um, however, we should try that. I mean, there's no reason putting database. Database is where your good stuff is. You shouldn't be allowed access to the internet. Your wireless access users shouldn't have direct access to it either. Because why would you have a, uh, that to be stupid? And nor do all of your other users or your printers. Printers have the access to the database server. The admin users don't. I think admin <coughs> users, you should have a jump server, control that jump server, let that access to all your servers. You can then control that apps, lap, uh, uh, jump server, you can log the crap out of it, allow access from admin users to there, and then jump to the other servers. Yeah, that's to me is logical security. Now, you can turn around having a flat network, we've got Windows Firewall, Defender, that kind of stuff, but this is going to stop half the stuff that you're trying to look. And not just that, if you start logging, you'll find stuff, you'll see stuff that people are doing that you shouldn't be doing, misconfigured servers. But basically, it doesn't need to talk to something, don't talk to it. More than likely, your, your web server, your people are going to talk to your web server, web server is going to talk to the database server, and back off, back again. So why allow access to database server? Why allow access to you know, printers? I mean, the VPN users, they don't need access to the printer. Not there. There's that. So layer three. Well, layer three, well, I'm, okay, well, let's go with this. So we know that basically the communication goes down the stack and it goes back up the stack and then it goes back the other way. When you're on the same VLAN, basically, I think uses layer two. It uses a address resolution, address resolution protocol up. Um, it uses the MAC address. It doesn't use the IP address to communicate when we use the MAC address. So PC1 is talking to PC3. Uh, we've got MAC address and IP address. What will happen is PC1 will need to know the MAC address of PC3 to send traffic. So they'll send out an ARP request. That will go as a broadcast. Every host on the VLAN will get that. If you've got a slash 20, every host on the VLAN will get that broadcast. And it will also say, look, I'm this IP address and here's my MAC address. Dot 30 will get that. And it will send back a unicast saying, hey, I'm this guy. Here's my MAC address. It'll then populate it into the ARP tables. And the switch will also make a note of it in its CAM table. So the next time you try to send from PC1 to PC3, it knows the MAC address it needs to send. The switch knows where both MAC addresses are, so it can more efficiently move it. And obviously there we go. That's how things work on a VLAN. IP address isn't really used. People think IP addresses are everything. They're not. But you need the IP address because it goes at the stack. But it's that. But the problem with this is that it's, a, it's very easy to attack. Man in the middle attack. It used to be really, really effective, especially for grabbing creds and career text, because you literally, the traffic passing through you. Um, PC2 is a bit of a troublemaker, okay, and he basically wants to see what the traffic is between the two. So what he basically does is he tells both of them, hey, those IP addresses, here's the MAC address for it. He tells him that one, he tells him the and you get that in the MAC table. You should see that. So now all traffic from PC1 to PC3 will be going through there. And if it's in clear text, hopefully it's all encrypted now. But effectively, you can actually see traffic going through. Um, server backup. You, if you're backing up servers, 
So I've heard the stories of people grabbing a whole server back up, a couple of gigs worth in PCAT. You can reassemble it. Uh, print jobs, right from doing print jobs, grab the whole packet capture, reassemble the page. Really, really good. Really, really effective. And that's the problem with uh, VMs. So uh, this is where it's going to get a bit strange. I'm quite proud of the next slide. It took me a long time. I hope you appreciate it. Hostbusters. Oh, yes. <laughs> it gets me there. <laughs> no copyright infringement there. That's not the real Slimer. Um, but um, host isolation. So what we can do, we can actually prevent the Layer 2 stuff from working, which is really quite cool. And force it to use Layer 3. Um, that took me a while as well. Okay, so um, let's just say, for example, we know we've got the VLAN, we know we've got the default gateway. If I can force the traffic to use IP addressing, what I can do is I can get to treat it as if it's traffic coming from outside the VLAN. And that way I can put control on it, put an ACL on it. It's quite straightforward. On a Cisco switch, it's really straightforward. It's just literally the command switch called protected. And that forces the devices to use IP addressing as validation and not the MAC address. So that man in the middle tap now becomes completely impossible, not completely impossible, it becomes highly unlikely. And uh, you basically get, um, you may not have the massive address, but also lateral movement. But you've got devices, people go onto your network, first thing they're do is going to run and hide. They're going to try and get from one machine to another machine, machine, collect credentials, collect files, do what they need to do, go and hide. You can prevent it by doing this. Once you put that command in, if you want to do it on your home routers, there's normally a tick box in the wider security settings. It's going to be called API isolation or host isolation. The small business range, Netgear, um, HP, and Cisco, they have that host isolation tick box in their GUI, so you can use that. And it basically forces the traffic up to um, layer 3. We then put an ACL inbound on the VLAN, saying this address range here, which is where you have address range of that VLAN, don't allow it in from outside. Because why would traffic be coming in from that, VLAN, that IP address range from outside? It's a good idea to have that this between VLANs on anyway, just in case people are crafting packets and sending stuff through. But, you know, no one hasn't, but, well, they do on the systems like this one. Basically what happens then is you defend, your, your attacker then has to find a new way of trying to get from one host to another host. Because effectively the traffic goes up, hits the gateway, the guy goes, oh, you're going from dot 10 to dot 30. Oh, hang on a second, I'm not allowed to traffic on that subnet, so it just blocks it. It's as simple as that. Really, really works quite well. Add other permissions like DHB snooping. This is another really cool one. Now, obviously, when you think your DHB servers on a different, different subnet, because that's good to have. Um, DHB request goes in, I'm this MAC address, I need an IP address. DHB server goes, yeah, have this IP address. He gets the IP address. Switch then records the MAC address, the IP address has been given, the least time it's been given from the DHP server, what VLAN is in, and what interface it's on. Now, that by itself isn't very interesting. It's not doing anything, it's just just text, but if we then add dynamic ARP inspection, we can do some really cool stuff. So the switch has now learnt all these devices which got DHP. It knows that that MAC address is on that interface, it's associated with that IP address. PC2 is playing up again. If anything is different, it won't work. It'll just drop the traffic and you'll get a log saved by ARP. So if you change the MAC address, that won't work. It simply just will not send traffic. If you change the IP address, it won't work. It will simply not send traffic. Effectively, if, someone, if you've got a static environment with lots of PCs, I know there's lots of environments now with lots of laptops moving around, but if you've got a static environment, this is going to stop people just plugging stuff in pretty easily. And then you add other stuff onto it as well. But the other thing this does do, again, another good slide here, Marvin, look at that. Blatant reconnaissance. Now everyone picks up on that. Um, Port security. So... Port security is another thing to do. Again, it's on the Cisco switch because um, it's easy to script on here. I don't think Juniper does this. Well, I know, I think Proc Aid might, but I'm um, confident for that. By default, uh, you can turn it on just using the switch port, port security command. By default, it only allows one MAC address. On the top example, we've we'll, we'll changed that to be two, and we specified the MAC address is to use. If you try and plug any other device with any other MAC address or a third device, it will go over to say, which basically means the port shuts down, no traffic will pass. You then administratively have to go in there and reopen that. So you know something's happened. You get that great moment where you can go and shoot it, the user's last off, and do the same thing. The bottom, the bottom solution is the same thing, but we're using sticky MAC addresses. What that does is it records the first MAC address it sees, it keeps it. When you unplug that device, 
The bottom starts aging those times, that's in seconds. When that goes down, that MAC address then gets removed, waiting for the next MAC address to arrive. Again, if you've got a static environment, it, why not? <laughs> this is simple. I don't understand the argument for not doing it. And if anyone says to me it's complicated, you're getting paid. It's your job. If it's too complicated, go and find something easy to do. And when you find out what it is, let me know. Uh, obviously, the big problem with this is you do put a lot everywhere and you don't have a static environment. You get a lot of people's error saving, a lot of people phone you up, and you get the silence of the lands. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I'm working hard here, people, come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so layer four. Now, the problem with layer four is it's old. So GDP, as you know it, as you use it for DNS and all that other stuff, then in 1980, TCP was invented in 1981. There have been many extensions and many new RSCs come out for it, but they're for extensions. If you're just using the bog standard TCP port from there to there, you're using that one. Um, and SMTP. No one's ever come back and gone secure SMTP. Probably even many reasons for that. You know, if you get a bit bored next weekend and you can write a new protocol, fantastic. They're not that easy to do. But also, if you buy an SMTP server, I can then say your URL content filter, spam filter, and all that other stuff to secure the mail. No one's gone back and made these protocols secure by design. <laughs> Backward capability, pain in the ass, a lot of money. They probably never will happen. Unless, of course, it's next generation where I don't know what's going to happen. But this is the problem. Vendors aren't doing, no one's securing this stuff. No one's going back and going, oh, we can do this better. So we have to live with what we've got. So we've got our network here. So what we can do is we can secure stuff. So if we've got our user there, our one user there, we know we should be talking to these other users. We know how to block that. Our perspection, we can make um, security host isolation, get that done. There's no way to talk to the wireless network. There's no reason for this subnet to talk to that. So we block that, all the VPN users, all the admin users. Or even printers as well. I mean, the database management servers you can get into as well, but printers are my bugbear. Oh. Um, who here manages printers? When was the last time you updated the firmware in your printer? Never. Hmm. When was the last time you updated the firmware on a Cisco switch? Or Never. Not a router. Exactly. When was the last time you patched your servers? Never. No, I can believe that. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, you know, there's patches, you know, Patch Tuesday comes out, you might have a 30 day cycle, or you may do it immediately. But I've seen production boxes which have been up for like five years, five and a half years. In fact, there was one I saw an update, so it was 2012, it was last rebooted. Um, no one applies downtime on the, on the Cisco device or the, the, the network device. And your printer doesn't need access to the internet, but it does need to be updated. But seriously, factor it in. Go to issue security updates very often, actually. Well, it depends on what comes out. That user does need access to these two VLANs, the yeah. web servers <coughs> and the application servers, probably, because that's probably where your database and your, and your um, sorry, your web traffic lives and your uh, DHP servers and domain controls and that kind of stuff lives. So you should just block all that access. It doesn't need that access. And suddenly you've made your LAN a much more friendly place for the traffic and harder for someone to move about without them, you know, neon signs going, look, traffic shouldn't be here. Um, and more importantly, you should apply it to all the VLANs. You know, not just one of them. Um, do a similar thing to VPN, do a similar thing to the wireless users. You know, consider what it is. Only needs to talk to something, only allow it. So at least this, it took me ages to find that font. And it didn't work very well. Um, so, uh, documentation. I know there's a few other talks today mentioned about documentation. It really is true. Uh, if you don't know what you got, how can you manage it? Simple as that. If it's on your network, chances are it might cause you a problem. You should know what's on your network. If there's something on your network that you don't know about, you don't control the network. <coughs> Simple as that. Patch and schedule. How is it connected to your network? Um, I'm a big advocate of patch and schedule. So go and get some Brady labels, put the same number on each end of a cable, and then go and patch it somewhere. <laughs> you know, I, I did suggest to someone once, they weed cables, and they, they then put number one, number two, number three, and yeah, it didn't end well. But um, if I hand you a cable, would you be able to tell me where that cable comes from? If I just randomly pick the cable up in your environment? Probably not. No. But if that number's on it, if you had a patching schedule, yeah, the cable still be removed, there's still an issue, but now you can 
massively reduce the amount of time you're going to find that plugged into. I mean, that's really simple to do, a bit laborious, but once you've done it, maintain it, it's good. A lot more things become in licensing. Network companies now realize they can't sell you a new switch every five years, so they license some of their features on there. But it's important to know when the license is off, because that's when the stuff will stop working, when those licenses run out. And license management. Again, you'd be surprised the amount of people they don't realize they're doing it. They don't get any email from the vendor saying, hey, this one's three months. It doesn't happen. Something's not working. You didn't got scramble, get the budget. Yeah, it's fine. IP address schema, again, where is it in the environment? So you see an IP address, straight away you know that that IP address range is associated with the wireless users. That IP address range is associated with the printers. Another reason for segmenting your network, because they're your groups. Makes five sense. Uh, let's stop with this. Now, well, the reason why that's needed on a network tool is that we need to know what protocols, what ports need to go across the network. Yeah, if it's a date-based VLAN, it probably doesn't need 443. Yeah, it's not no web traffic going there. So it's important you need to know what type of traffic going on the network because it could be blocking the ports and that kind of stuff. Work instructions is a big one. If you're doing something day to day, business as usual, write it down. Uh, it may sound stupid because you're doing it every day, but especially if you like legal stuff, um, logs aren't admissible as evidence in court unless you turn into a business artifact. You can only do that if you can prove it's a repeatable step and how you achieved that log. So it could be blatant that person logged in and he did this. Great. Right. But you can't use that in court unless you can turn around and say, how do you retrieve the log? I retrieved it like such and such. Hmm, prove it. And then you give them a copy of your, your logs and they don't go through that. Yes, it's a repeatable step. But without that repeatable step, that log's not going to be able to use. It's, it's worthless. Um, not just that, you get new people in. This is how we do stuff. It's all about that. And not just that, you can probably find, we'll find more ways of doing stuff. Oh, that was like Who doesn't have a network diagram? Yes. <coughs> Yes, you're lying. Okay, but um, <laughs> amount of times I've gone somewhere and go, okay, show us your network diagram. I, I, I can draw you it. No, no, show me it. Where is it? We don't have one. And that's annoying because, again, once you've got that network diagram, you can then monetize the diagram. So that switch, you know, if that's going to cost X amount of money if it's down, you know how much that's, you know, you can put it on the diagram. You know, on that point that you raised it, I probably ask who has a network diagram and doesn't have IPFS schema because that is the bigger problem when yes. it comes to knowing your net. The IP address schema could be more precise though because you could have IP helpers and other information you on there. Define, uh, show you your bilans, your assets, your... It's a separate document. It's more, more likely to have more information on it. Obviously, it's just going to have that address range there, but that will have other things, for example, IP helpers, other stuff as so well. should live hand in hand, right? should live hand in hand, but the two separate documents. Um, but same with servers. If you've got a, a rack load of servers hanging off one switch and that switch went down, how much of those servers goes? So it's the whole company gone then. So you can monetize the network diagram. And nothing should be going on to your network without someone either giving you permission or asking you permission. You know, if, I, if you go to an environment and say, right, why is that there? And you can't go, uh, <sighs> you know, you should know. There should be a ticket for someone requesting it, you know, especially with account creation. You know, why is that count there? Oh, so and so. Where's the ticket? There's a ticket. Right, great. Yeah, and also if you want to do stuff off your own back, make sure you, you've got it documented that you're going to do it. Because one, you can roll it back, but two, when it goes wrong, which it will, at some point, you can turn around and say, well, I did this because it's planned and this is what I decided to do. And I wasn't just doing stuff, making it up because that's when mistakes happen. That's when things don't get recorded. And then six months down the line, you can't remember who did it and why is it there. So you take it out and then that thing stops working. You can't work out why that thing stopped working. And it, you know, it's not good. And so logging. Um, that's the most important thing. It's been mentioned again several, several times today. I've seen people either get logs and don't read them or they don't bother logging. It's one, one or the other. Well, they just don't do logging. Um, without logs, how do you know something's happened? How do you know something's working? How do you know something occurred? You simply don't. Now, what should you log? That's up to you. It's up to your environment. No two networks are the same. Um, I will say, though, on Windows boxes, if you are doing logging, make sure you log event ID 1102, my favorite event log. <laughs> uh, Windows event log 1102 is deletion of security logs. So if you delete the security logs, it creates a log. If you delete that log, it creates a log telling that, so basically you know something's happened. You don't know what's happened because your log's been deleted. 
but you know there's been an event. You know someone's done something. Someone's deliberately done it, but and that should be a, you know a bit of a an indicator of something not right here, especially if it wasn't you deleting a log. And finally, cloud services. This is one of the reasons why we have problems with networks now: virtual environments and cloud environments. Virtual environments, the, net, well, the server teams tend now to be configuring the SXI host switch, you know, the virtual switch on there, hence we have flat networks on those things. But cloud as well. The cloud is fantastic, virtual environments are fantastic, scalable, cheap, fantastic. Big part of this is logging point of view, though, is everything in green, your response is working in blue, gray, <coughs> cloud spirals. If you look at uh, infrastructure as a service, you notice you're not responsible for the network or the storage or the service or the virtualization. That means that you're not getting any network logs. Now, unless you're the police or security service, or you've got a contract, you prearranged it to get them from them, you're not getting those logs. If you go, look, I've got some traffic hitting my system. Can I have some of those network logs, please? They're going to go, mm, no, GDPR, uh, data protection. Um, other traffic might be on there, which is not yours. You're not getting them. It's that simple. So if you are going to be stuck to browser services, just consider what you're not getting, especially from a log point of view. And if you're not logging at the moment, then you're probably not that bothered, but you know, it is important. And with that, uh, any questions? You did mention VLAN 1. Uh, it was on one of the slides, wasn't it? Never use VLAN 1. VLAN 1 is the default VLAN that all the vendors use. And uh, especially with VLAN hopping and stuff like that, never use that. And make sure you change the VLANs in your major trunks as well. So if we're protected... Are you comfortable? Yeah. Okay, great. fine. Um, change the switch ports when you're doing the client isolation. Mm -hmm. What happens in situations where you've got sort of wave systems that are based in the computer rather than a separate... System? It's not going to work for every different situation. It's mainly for data. Voice is a completely different concern. Yeah. Voice... Voice traffic is very different. It's obviously all UDP, uh, so you can't even like connection based stuff. So, yeah, no two networks are the same. Use at your own risk. Oh, come on. Next level. I've got. What's your thoughts about network management and how it can be done properly and well? Um, individual to each individual system. You tell me your system, I'll walk through the requirements. But uh, I can't tell you, oh, you can do this, you must do this, you must do this. You must manage the network, but how you manage the network, why you don't manage the network, and what parts of the network you manage more than others, it's purely down to the environment. There's no such thing as two networks. What works for them won't work for him. Simple as that. Can you put security policies around port mirroring and net flow analysis? Absolutely. If you want that, it has to be requested. It has to be signed off you know, by your security guy because if then their risk. And more importantly, it must be reversed once it's completed. So like when you're doing a pen test, you must... Put a time frame on it. So we're going to use that because there. What are you going to do for it? We're just going to mirror the port. Fine, fantastic. Uh, what time are you going to stop doing it? That time, fine. Yeah, you, know, you really need security ports. Whenever you punch anything, any hole on your system, you need to have that tightly agreed. But more importantly, you need to take the blame from you, sorry, the risk from you, <laughs> onto someone else. Make sure you got an adult signing it off because ultimately it's them there for you. You want to come down to you and go, Arr! Because that's what they do. Um, you can show them the email saying, look, there you go. You can tell me to. Also, things for radiators, who don't want X, any other security mechanism. 802.1e oh, yeah. is my favorite, MacSec. MacSec is fantastic. So MacSec basically means it encrypts the traffic between the host and the switch. Uh, so if you've got a 24-port switch and all the hosts are running MacSec, what are you? 802.1e, Cisco equipped MacSec. 802.1e is the standard. There's an agent on the machine and it encrypts the traffic to the, the switch port. So you've 24 different encrypted links. Now, if they go over a trunk, for every time they go, every hop they take, they take a different uh, level of encryption, a, a different key every time. So you've got 24, they're all different keys. Goes over that link, it's a different key, goes over that different key until it gets unencrypted at the other end. Where's the hardware overhead on that encryption and decryption? And what, what ultimately does that? Is it a separate ASIC on the switch or is the CPU overhead on the... PC does it? Because there's an overhead, right? It's a both. It's both. It's, tiny, it's reasonably tiny because obviously it only has to be secured from there to there. But yeah, it is an overhead. But then again, you got to look at your traffic profile and what your traffic's doing, and does it work for you? There could be a better way of doing it. For example, use fiber. Uh, fiber removes your tempest issues. There's no be able to get that from the thing. Um, but then you know someone can still break into fiber. So secure your route. 
uh, anti tamper stickers on your trunking. Basic principle though is the layer security. You can't rely on one layer of security, you have to be defensive there. Yeah, and unfortunately, there is no such thing as one size fits all. No. Like I say, the Cisco stuff, if you've got like a, you work in insurance, or you work in automotive, or you work in factory, or you work in maritime, you work in, you know, whatever, they're all very, very different ones. You may still use an Active Directory, you know, 2016, you may still use Windows 10 machine, but the network is where it changes, depending on the thing. So you, you do see people move in industry, and you see mistakes, because they take some of the things they learned in that industry and try and apply them to their new place of work, which probably not the best solution for that new place of work. But that's what they've always used. That's what it worked. Yeah, different very different industry. Farming doesn't work for banking. Banking doesn't work for retail. Retail doesn't work for credit cards and so on. Well, we've got PCI compliance. Yeah. Well, PCI DSS is not actually a, a, a law, is it? It's just a guideline. It's easy to have it and not have it, but then the password requires a PCI is, was it seven characters? Um, it must be one number. Yeah, uh, and it's like, yeah, if you want to beat the bare minimum of standards, that's not a good standard to me. You put your hand up, I know you're scratching your head, but uh, that's good enough for me. Think of a question. No. <laughs> oh, Software yeah. defined networking, where do you stand on that? Um, about here. Um, so, it's coming, it's yeah. there. Uh, you've got good some, idea, bad idea from a security. Um, it has its uses. Again, it depends on the purpose where it's used and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of um, software, def- uh, SD WANs coming out now. Um, that's the way things are going. The virtualiz- virtualization room. Um, there's no escaping it. No. I mean, the next San Francisco is fantastic. And it's all virtual, it's, it's great. So it's not, it's not going away. No. It, I, do you feel that it makes security simpler or more complex? Yeah, it presents a different type of challenges. It removes some of the layer one stuff, probably increases the layer two and layer three stuff. Uh, and then obviously you've got the box security, apart from box security, which is obviously layer one, lots of locky comms room. The amount of pictures you see on Twitter where people post you know, your cabinet and there's a toilet next to it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, dude. The network bit just works, so just put it where it is and that happens a lot. There is. Oh, okay. Just looking pensive. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.